Good afternoon. I hope you guys had a great day today at Cotopia and uh, also uh, that the next talks are going to be very interesting. I at least had a very interesting uh, morning, at least starting with uh, the yoga and then I watched some very interesting talks. It's uh, good to see that you guys came in such big numbers today to our talk. Uh, I assume that you're going to be very interesting in what we did and how our journey went. Um, maybe good to go through some house rules first. Uh, please ask your questions in the Slack channel ING. Uh, we are with the three of us. The people that are not talking will be monitoring the chat and we'll also try to answer them. And at the end of the presentation, we will try to highlight some of the questions that have been asked. Um, and uh, yeah, please keep yourself muted. Uh, at the end, if we still have some time, we will open up the. Uh, we will open up if we uh, if there are some more interesting questions that people can also ask during the presentation. Then, without further ado. So, we are from ING. ING is a big company in uh, uh, also in the banking, but also in the tech industry. We have offices in 40 different countries, 14 of them which are retail offices, uh, retail companies. Uh, maybe good to iterate to explain what a retail bank is. It's actually the ING that you and me know as a customer. Uh, you go to the supermarket, you pay with your ING card, that's what the retail customers do. The other customers that we have is what we call wholesale banking, also corporate clients. Uh, those are the big companies uh, that lend money or do other things, have other deals with uh, with ING. We are doing that in more countries, uh, but we are, uh, we are actually doing that in more countries than 40, but we have offices in 40 countries for them. We have 38.8 million primary customers. These are the customers that are very actively using our products, our banking products. We have 56,000 employees and we have more than a thousand DevOps teams in ING, which is quite a lot and this also poses its own challenges. Then, who are we? I'm Wouter, I'm an engineering lead at ING. Uh, before this, I was working in game development for five years where I developed MMORPGs. Um, in ING, I became very intrigued by the DevOps way of working and in continuous delivery. And that's also where I'm working in now. Cosmin. Hello everyone, I'm Cosmin. Uh, I work in uh, IT area for almost one decade. Uh, I, was, I was always passionate about deployments and uh, automating of processes. And I came in ING for uh, one month, uh, one, one year, sorry. And um, yeah, we built these amazing templates we will, uh, that we will share with you today. Thank you, Florian. Hi, uh, nice to virtually meet you all. Uh, my name is Florin, as you can already see on the screen. Um, I'm a senior DevOps engineer here at ING Tech in Romania. This is the country where I also live in. Uh, but that's not all. I've been an um, uh, engineer. I've been working in IT for the past 12 years. And in what seems now like another lifetime, I've been a system administrator for about half that period. And about five or six years ago, I decided to switch gears a bit and I became a DevOps. Uh, the last three years I have spent here, uh, lovely at ING. Uh, trying to have fun and trying to automate everything I could get my hands on. And uh, we'll share a part of that with you today. Hopefully you like it. Uh, in my spare time, I'm pretty outdoorsy and I like playing tennis most of all. However, due to restrictions in this period, I play guitar a lot. And um, I really hope you enjoy it again. So I'll give the mic back to Walter and see you later. Thank you, Florian and Cosmin. So uh, before I start with the agenda, you might be wondering why us? Um, we have been building uh, Azure templates for a while now. We have been doing that for ING. In ING, we're actually responsible for the continuous delivery in Azure DevOps for many applications. Uh, we want to do that in an easy and scalable way. Uh, so we did that with Azure templates. Of course, with that, uh, I will tell a bit about the problems and the solutions that we've made. That's what this talk will be about. When implementing these solutions, we of course faced many challenges. I mean, what fun would an adventure be without its own challenges? That's what we will also be talking about, about the modularity, flexibility, the quality, quality and the maintainability, and about the learning curve of Azure DevOps. We will finish off with some final thoughts and a Q&A. Then, um, the problem. So, for anyone that has an ING account, 
Um, if you go to the App Store and you were looking for the ING app, you would see this overview. In ING, we have many different applications and it has got to do a bit with the legacy of where we're coming from. ING is an old bank. Um, and as you probably also noticed it in very old times, the banks used to be very country divided. Uh, it would be very difficult to have a bank in multiple countries. Whereas what you see now with companies like Revolut and 26, they just have one application and they serve all their customers all over the world with the same application. Now, we want to do this too, but we still have these applications to take care of. And you also cannot just simply shut off one complete application and move all your customers to a different application. So what do you do? We have 14 different retail countries and every of these retail country has their own application. On top of that, we also have different domains like an investment domain. What you can see on the image, we have certain investment applications from ING as well. So um, of course, you want to standardize. And uh, what normally happens when you standardize, you actually add on top of the solution. You add on top of the problem. Um, if we have 14 different bank applications and we create another one, well, what prevents us from making 15 different applications that we now have to maintain a whole stack of? So when implementing a solution, you want to also be able to enforce it. You also want to be able to have people move there. And what is then the solution? It's a platform. That is something that has been done in ING for the past five years. It's something that we call the touchpoint platform. The touchpoint platform makes sure that people connect to one single point from all the countries that ING has and that they do things the same way. Examples of this are authentication and data storage. Before we had authentication, which was done in 14 different countries, mostly similar ways but still with some minor differences. Nowadays, it is mostly done all through one single platform, the Touchpoint platform. And this is very beneficial because when we add a new way of authentication or we add uh, a new layer of security, everybody who is using that platform immediately has this new feature. If we want to stay compliant and we want to update things such that they are secure again or we want to do some patching, we only have to change it once in the platform. And everyone that is working in ING that is maintaining an application can benefit from that. We do the same thing for data storage, where we store the customer information and also the relationship between customers, which is very vital for a bank, um, and also with other products. Now, let's take a look at a pipeline, because that is in the end what we were trying to solve. If you have your standard pipeline, you will have your code, your build, test, publish, scan, release, and eventually your runtime. And we are all DevOps teams. We are all autonomous. Uh, we are all making our applications ourselves, which also meant that we were building our pipelines ourselves. And in time, it starts to look a bit like this. We have four different teams and they all have their own pipelines. But as you can see, they look quite similar. And if you look at the similarities, you would actually find out that the right part of this pipeline is very much the same. We all build in the same way. We all test in the same way. We all publish in the same way. And uh, what is actually so different? If you would talk to these DevOps teams, they would claim it's different. They would claim, but my build has these special artifacts I need, or my, I do a special kind of test. And of course, you don't want to uh, remove that functionality. You don't want to go to one of the team and say, no, you're not allowed to do this test anymore. It's the other way around. You want to empower them to do the test, but you still want them to do it in a standard way. So we were trying to build a platform for pipelines, but we don't want them to depend on us. The solution for this was templates. And we have a lot of people that build, a lot of teams that build applications and they use the build template. And you use a build template depending on which technology you use. You can, for example, have a Scala build template. You can have a Maven build template as long as they produce the same artifacts. And then when you test, you have the same thing. Depending on which test you want to run, you have different test templates that you can run. If these tests get updated, we might add a template, we might modify a template to always make sure that these things stay compliant and standardized. Um, so 
in a nutshell, this is the, uh, the solution that we made with Azure Templates. We try to solve it in a platform kind of way, but it doesn't come without challenges. And that is what the next part will be about. And we'll be talking to Cosmin about the challenges of templates with modularity and flexibility. Thank you, Walter. Hello, everyone. Um, give me just one second. Okay, right now. Okay, so I'll start with a question. How many of you had to spend time on something they didn't want or had to rebuild the entire solution from the scratch just because another piece of code was not suited for their needs? Well, many teams have many ways. So zooming in on what Walter said, uh, we have uh, multiple processes, but let, let's take build process, for example. You have a piece of code where you need to store somewhere and uh, you, you, you will generate an artifact, your application, a var, a jar, an X, and so on. But you also want to change a few stuff from team to team. You want to uh, use a different build tool. You want to use a different Java version. You want to store your secrets and your passwords in a different place. So uh, this is how you can do it. Uh, but let's say the deployment template or the deployment process. You need a set of artifacts and eventually you will have everything running into a place, right? And the thing you can change is a strategy, how you deploy it, the policies, how you, uh, what you want to enforce or not, and the targets, the, the place where you want your application to run. So in, in summary, you will have a standardized input and output, right? But the behavior will be exposed to the user. So you will not, you, you will not be bound by some specific rules except the input and the output, which is uh, a standard, but the behavior of the uh, everything, it will be exposed to you as a user. So this is what we did, uh, concrete. Uh, we exposed these parameters uh, to, the, to the user. It can change very easily anything that they want and they think is suited for their needs, imposing these uh, standards and respecting these standards of the input and the output. Okay, but right now uh, we have some flexible templates, but maybe uh, my team don't want to use the entire floor, the entire templates. Are they uh, modular enough to, to do that? Yes. Uh, if they have these specific standards of input and output, everything is very modular. Uh, let's take three teams, for example. We have team banana, tomato, and kinders, let's say. And we have this team bananas, which went full bananas with everything in here. They want to build, test, publish, scan, deploy. Yeah, they want to do anything. But team tomato is more special. They don't want to publish stuff. Uh, okay, it's very easy. They just pick and drop uh, uh, the, the published template uh, and everything works as expected. But in Kinders uh, is more special. They're from chocolate, right? So they, uh, they want to build, test, publish, but the scanning part is more tricky. They want to make it their own, they, their own solution. So they just keep the input and output because there is a standard and the behavior inside the template, they change it. So they put it in there in the workflow and it's very easy. So after this explanation, you may ask, okay, okay, but what about the dependencies? Well, the dependencies, as far as we uh, notice, there are two types of dependencies. There are hard dependencies and soft dependencies. Hard dependencies are when an artifact is, uh, uh, is required in order for the application, to, for the template to run. But the soft dependencies are just, uh, it needs to be there in order for the workflow to, to work, right? Maybe uh, you need to publish something, but nobody expecting that publishing artifact, but your workflow is expecting. So now that you have a, Another, an understanding about the, the, the modularity and flexibility and how we envision. Let me give you a few tips and tricks that we learned during our, uh, our journey. Templates should reflect functionalities that can be reused easily. So you have a template. Uh, you may think of like a Java class where you just import it, reference it, and use it uh, as you want. So this is what we did with the templates. We um, created these templates that can be referenced from anywhere. And um, they are invoked, they are used, and they are doing their job. Templates reduce also the errors because uh, 
many, the many the better, right? Uh, you have multiple users that uh, are testing their own use cases and they want to, uh, again, cover the, the needs that they have. So uh, I will have some use cases, Jim will have some use cases, Ben will have some use cases, everybody will have their own use cases. And if you sum it up, we will have a lot of ground covered already by uh, using one set of templates for many teams. And again, templates can be used as a great source of inspiration. Uh, we all use Stack Overflow. So uh, if you think of uh, one piece of template as a functionality, because this is uh, what it is, uh, it's a functionality in one template, um, it's very easy to just pick and uh, choose whatever you want. Um, it's your <laughs> little Stack Overflow in a box, which can be added and removed uh, how you want. This is what I had to say. So thank you, Florian. What is yours? Thank you very much, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello again. How are you doing? I hope you had a good uh, uh, lunch. I hope you're maybe enjoying your coffee with us today. And I hope we are really enjoying our presentation. Um, I'm going to walk you uh, through the, our next couple of challenges or the challenges we saw in uh, creating this, uh, these templates. And I would like to start off by talking about quality and maintainability. But before I do that, I'm going to ask you to please let's take a step back with me and reflect a bit about what my two colleagues have just said. Let's do a small recap, if you will. Um, so what's our status quo? What's our, um, what's our situation here? We're in a company, maybe not this one, any company, and you have a lot of teams. And all of these teams want essentially to do the same thing. They want to build and they want to deploy. Of course, they want to build and deploy in maybe different ways with different modules. These modules might be um, mixed and matched, might be in a different order from one team to another. And of course, the code is going to differ. So of course, what we did, what Wouter and Cosmin highlighted was try to harmonize this in, in templates. These modules became our templates and we wrapped everything together in a pipeline. So we created our uh, templated pipelines. So um, the problem is, um, quality-wise, that the more teams use your templates, the more teams adopt this pipeline, the bigger the problem you might have if your code breaks. If your pipeline stops working, if your templates fail one day, you're going to wake up with tens and tens of people asking why they cannot build and why they cannot deploy. And you want to avoid that from happening at all costs. You want to do everything in your power to maintain a high quality and a high standard of your templates and also high availability. So you must, of course, realize what you're dealing with. You are dealing with templates, which are essentially uh, libraries, basically pieces of code people use in order to do something and not write the code themselves. And you do what you do with any part of code. If you say test it, then you are right. You might as well test it. So uh, we're going to do just that. And we're going to take the example of a very uh, pipeline YAML our customers might have. So you see here on the screen uh, an example, an YAML example of a pipeline, which basically fetches some code from a certain repository, either from a branch like master or develop or from a tag. And then from that uh, templates repository, it calls on some templates to do some actions. In this case, to build, then to test the build, to store the artifacts in Artifactory, in uh, Nexus, in whatever artifact server you might have, and then to deploy them to the event test in this case. And that's exactly what we did. We realized the minimum types of tests we need are at least one integration test, which is this one, and some unit tests. And for example, we created an integration test, which is basically a pipeline, testing our pipeline templates with, of course, a pipeline. So. A good uh, way to do this would be to integrate this uh, integration test, this integration test pipeline, into your pull request or branch policies. So, for example, whenever you are merging your develop to release or your develop to master branch, you have this uh, pipeline running, and um, you can ensure that all of your templates are still working well and are still working well together. So you can sleep better at night knowing that the quality of the code, which is in your master or release branch, which serves maybe your production, um, is very good. So it's, it's stable. One other type of code you can, uh, of testing, sorry, you can do is uh, unit testing. You can basically create multiple small pipelines, which just test 
every template. And a use case for that would be whenever somebody might try to modify a template, um, this, um, this uh, pipeline can run on a commit and they can be alerted even before they do a merge request much earlier that something they have done is, my, is maybe wrong. So they need to, uh, to have another look. I think this ensures us overall a very high standard of quality. And as I said, we can sleep a bit better at night uh, knowing our colleagues can, uh, can always build and deploy uh, without, um, without some unforeseen uh, problems. Uh, the next uh, thing I want to, to talk about is, uh, is maintainability. Um, is we talked a bit about branches, about uh, tags, um, and I want to walk you through the uh, merging, the Git strategy we adopted and we found it suits best uh, our templated approach. Of course, we start with a master branch and we use tags. Uh, we use a semantic versioning. For example, we start with 1.0.0. Out of the master branch, we create a develop. And assuming you are not a one person development team and you have multiple developers, we're going to have feature branches and bug fix branches to address any feature or bugs there might be. Of course, should the case be where you find a bug in your master branch, you can create a hotfix branch, address the bug, and then merge it back to develop and master. And of course, since you have a new master commit, tag it with a new version. Then of course, at some point, merge your features and your bug fix branches back to your develop, and then merge everything back to master and tag it with a certain version. And the wheels of the bus go round and round, and the cycles go, and the cycle goes on and on and on and on forever. What did we accomplish with that? Well, we first give our users the possibility to use an immutable version. If they know their build and release always works with version 101, they can use that specific tag, which is just that, an immutable version. A git commit hash, which will never change. So they can always go back to, and they can always depend on. If they, however, decide they want the latest stable uh, code, which they already know it's in master based on our tests, they can use master. And if they're early adopters, like beta testers, they can use the latest code, which might not or might be stable from the develop branch. And this kind of wraps up the problem of quality and maintainability, or at least how we address it um, at, a, at a very high level. Then um, the next thing I want to, to tackle is uh, the learning curve. Uh, I experienced, my colleague experienced, and you might experience uh, yourself uh, if you're going to adopt um, Azure DevOps. So some of you might have already been there. Um, some of you might plan to do it. So this is just our experience um, our experience using um, Azure DevOps. Uh, I'm gonna use this very nice image and um, I'm just gonna start by saying, if you have uh, encountered Azure DevOps or if you know something about it, or even if you don't, um, the, one of the first things you realize about Azure DevOps is that, is that it encapsulates multiple tools. Uh, for example, for, uh, for a typical DevOps ecosystem, uh, it has um, a uh, Azure Pipelines, or uh, a CI tool, so um, a tool to build and, uh, and release. It has uh, Azure Artifacts, a uh, place to uh, put your uh, binaries, your archives, so a repository um, server. And of course, it has, um, um, yeah, it has uh, repos, Azure repos, a place where you put your code. Uh, as you can already uh, anticipate, there are a lot, basically, of tools in a single place. So that might be like might seem like a problem at first, but it actually makes things a lot uh, a lot easier, uh, or at least that was our experience. Uh, I use this picture because sometimes you might feel like this. You might uh, be in a new in a new company, or you might um, open a new a new CI tool, and you, you see multiple pipelines. Uh, some uh, some pipelines to do some some builds, which depend on other pipelines, which in turn trigger pipelines which do releases, and then trigger other pipelines which do tests, and so on. So it might seem like a very complex ecosystem. I think it's a very nice um, thing to have everything in one single place. All of uh, all of these Azure uh, tools, if you choose to use them uh, in a in a single place, and I think that makes the learning experience uh, quite smooth. And in turn, if you adopt this templated uh, the templated logic, um, I think they go this goes hand in hand and very well um, with uh, with how Azure is meant to be used. 
Um, so to put things into a graph, I'm going to use this uh, time versus expertise OX, OX, OY, uh, Y graph. Um, my Azure DevOps learning experience looks something like this, and I'm gonna break it down for you. Uh, basically, we had an initial um, learning part, which is um, a steep curve, um, but that for me means that there was a very small period in which I, I read a lot, and then very quickly I managed to grasp and learn a lot um, of what Azure DevOps has to offer, so that I managed in the second part uh, to become quite good at it and be really happy to play around with what I have just learned, be able to put it into practice and develop these templates. So although some people might refer to a steep learning curve as something very difficult um, to tackle, uh, for me, um, it, was, um, it was something that I managed to learn real quick. And the last part of Azure DevOps uh, learning curves, curve, sorry, looks like this. Um, it's basically a shallow learning curve where your proficiency comes in diminishing returns. Uh, what that means is that, for example, um, during this orange part here, uh, you might learn 50 or 60% of all the knowledge you need um, to be a really good uh, Azure DevOps engineer. And then you might need maybe one more year uh, to learn uh, the rest of the, the fine um, granularity and fine uh, tuning uh, tricks. Uh, and, um, and tools you need to, to, to the rest. Uh, or at least that was my experience. I'm really curious, uh, what is your experience? If any of you are using or have used Azure DevOps, please let us know in the ING channel what your experience with uh, Azure DevOps um, is. And with that, I'm concluding our, um, our presentation here today. But before I go and before uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the mic to you for some questions. I will leave you with these final thoughts. Um, by using templates, by using this approach, instead of a single block of code or multiple GUI jobs, which you always had to uh, parameterize, you always had to open a lot of tabs uh, to, to change, we basically overcame the problem of many teams using many different pipelines of, um, of the lack of um, consistency between teams. And um, because we gave them a single pipeline to use, we brought about faster time to market. Um, for example, uh, teams who adopt and are on board on our pipeline um, in 10 minutes or 20 minutes can already start building. And probably in a matter of hours, they are already ready to deploy. That means we have created more time for feature development for our colleagues. They don't have to worry now about creating new pipelines, about maintaining the old ones, about changing the old ones. No, they just have to focus on creating and um, making new features for ING and we take care of the rest. And with that, we really hope to inspire you to also think in platforms and let us know what you think on our channel. Thank you very much. 